Well, well, good morning. How exciting to see all of you here. Uh, not just, I, I thought that everyone would come from about a radius of about 300 yards, but actually, there's a whole group here from Spain. Anywhere, who's come further than Spain? We've got New York. New York? Just for today? That is amazing. I salute you. <laughs> OK, so uh, it's a Saturday morning. You've all been hard at work all week. I know uh, I have. Um, but it would be much more fun for me is if you would keep your brain switched on and let's have a conversation as we go. I have far more to tell you than will fit in three quarters of an hour. But we will finish somehow um, uh, on time. And, uh, but, uh, but, but I'll be guided by you about how, how far we get. Because I'd much rather, this is, this is kind of a technical talk. I'm going to try to explain to you a bit about how type inference works, at least in Haskell. And I'd like you to go away with a sort of visceral sense, not only here, but kind of here, about what really happens when type inference is going on. Um, but it's a really exciting bit. That type inference is something that has really blossomed in um, the context of functional programming. So I know that you know, I'm going to show you mainly Haskell stuff. I know that probably most of you are Scala folk, right? So it's all right. I still love you. Uh, Scala is a great language. Um, and Scala, of course, has type inference. Um, so what's the goal here? Uh, we're, good, we're trying, uh, type inference and type checking generally, we're trying to reject the bad programs, the ones that add integers to booleans, and we're trying to accept the good ones, right? But it's a little bit more than that. When we reject a bad one, we'd like to give a decent error message to say what went wrong. And more subtly, less obviously, when we accept the good ones, we're going to elaborate them. So I'm going to start off by saying what elaboration means. So uh, here's a bit of, I'm going to show you a lot of code. So if you can't see the screen, you're going to be in trouble. You know, try to get somewhere where you can see the screen. Um, uh, OK, so, here's, so yellow is Haskell source code. Blue is sort of elaborated code. All right, so uh, here we go. So foo is a function that um, uh, sorts a list and uh, reverses a list and then sorts it. Does syntax make sense? This is lambda. Um, Actually, that should be an arrow if this is sort Haskell. Uh, so reverse is polymorphic, right, for all A list of A to list of A. And sort is not only polymorphic, it has a type class constraint. It says for all A's such that, um, that, that are ordered, um, uh, list of A to list of A. OK, so this should be well typed. Now, what, is, what do I mean by elaboration? First thing I mean is that this sort function here and this reverse function, they're polymorphic. So corresponding to the type, that corresponding to the for all, we give them an argument, a type argument, that says at what type to instantiate that. So this says instantiate reverses for all with int. So reverse substitute uh, um, int for a, you get list of int to list of int, and that's right for foo. Right? And similarly for sort, I'm going to instantiate with int. And sort is a bit more complicated because it's also taking this, it's what's this class constraint? In the elaborated language, that corresponds to a value parameter, a little record of functions that allow you to do ordering that's passed to sort. So here I call it $f ordint. There's nothing special about the dollar. It's just a name that the user doesn't have access to. Um, and I, uh, oh, and this is a bug. This should say $f ordint. It's just a value uh, at runtime of type numint. And you should think of a value of type numint as being a little record. Does that make sense so far? Yeah? OK, so I'm, I'm looking around because I'm really, really important. As soon as you, yes, yes, question. No, no, thumbs up, good. So once you get lost, things are going to get worse that quickly. So, yes. So should it should only be ordered, not numbered. Uh, should, it should have been, uh, that's right, two typos. One of this, this should have said $F ordint, and the other is this should have said ordint. Thank you. Yes, well spotted. It was just uh, testing the audience, yes. Um, <laughs> and yes, from the ordint interface. Good, OK. So, second thing. Um, uh, we need to do. So this foo was monomorphic. It had a type signature that said list of int to list of int. What if foo, foo itself was polymorphic? It took a list of, it took a list of A's, right? And, and, uh, but it, it, it doesn't just work for list of ints. It works for list of A's. That means they have to be ordered. Well, in that case, I also have to add foo, foo's definition in the elaborated program has a big lambda. Right? That's a lambda for the type that corresponds to the for all. Right? They line up exactly. And this lambda d lines up exactly with that ord. Right? That's, the, that's the value argument for passing the dictionary. This is the type um, abstraction here. So uh, as well as adding, uh, as passing uh, a and d to sort, I need to abstract a and d from foo. Make sense? OK. So, uh, so that's the, we've got to do all of that in elaboration. And the last thing we need to do is if foo was a bit, little bit more complicated here, it took a list of list of A's, sorted that list of lists in some lexicographic way, and then concatenated them together. I've given you the types here. 
right? Then, let's see. Oh, foo will only work on ordered things, of course. Um, but I'm obliged to pass to sort something that will be ordering on lists of things, not just ordering on things. So I need to get, a, get from this D, which has type order, a record of ordering functions on values of type A, to this D2, which is, a, takes, which is an ordered list of A. How do I get from a record of functions today ordering on A to ordering list of A from the instance declaration? Right? So you, the Scala implicit does just the same thing. Right? You have something equivalent to this in Scala, don't you? Right? So, uh, so that's really, from this thing comes this function, f, dollar f, ordered list, and I apply that function to d, that's this guy, to get d2, that's this ordered list of a. Right? So the, the last thing I need to do in this elaboration process is to um, inject sort of these dictionary transformer things that take the raw material passed into foo and turn it into the kind of things I need to pass to the things that foo calls. OK, so far so good. That's going to be it. For that. that's, that's really all I need to tell you about elaboration. Um, so the name of the game, for this is a type correct program, the name of the game for type correct programs is figure out all the types, figure out the type of every single intermediate sub-expression, every function call, every, everything, and then elaborate the program into this form. Why elaborate? Well, um, partly these dictionaries really have runtime um, stuff, right? I really do pass these things at runtime. So just as implicits get passed at runtime, dictionaries too in, in uh, Haskell. So that's one reason for elaboration. The other reason, these big lambdas and type applications, they don't exist at runtime, but GHC's intermediate language is statically typed. So they allow each compiler transformation pass maintains these types, and we can do a, a sort of sanity check to type check that the result of each transformation is still type correct. So it's, a, it's really an internal consistency check for the compiler, but it's been a very healthy one for us. So far, so good? Any questions? Hmm. I shall be uh, upset if nobody asked any questions, but I'm just hoping that we're good so far. OK, so enough for elaboration. Now back to type inference. How are we going to figure out the types of all these intermediate uh, values? So here is an example. So here's this foo. Uh, lambda x is reverse x is paired with, this is just a tuple, and and x is. Did I give you the type of and? Yes, it takes a list of booleans. Now, how are we going to type check this? So the way we do it is, um, and this will be true in the Scala compiler as well, I'm pretty certain, would be to start off, we come across this lambda to begin with. We say, oh, what type does x's have? Well, some type, I don't know, let's call it alpha. So we're going to put in the environment that x's has type alpha. So alpha here is just going to be the name for a type that we haven't yet figured out sometimes called a meta-type variable, sometimes called a unification variable. Right? Meta-type variable because it's a variable that ranges over types that we're going to fill in later. OK, now we're going to type check what this call here, reverse of x's. What do we learn from that? What do we learn from that? Well, reverse is polymorphic. So I'd better instantiate reverse at some type. I'm going, to, I'm going to replace A with some particular type. I don't know what yet. Let's call it beta, another unknown type. So if I instantiate reverses type with beta, I get list of beta to list of beta, right? So um, now, now, this list of beta that reverses, reverse takes had better be the same as um, x's, right? Because reverse is applied to x's. So alpha had better be equal to list of beta. OK, crucial moment. Is if you can see why that equality must hold, then, you're, then, then you know, you're good to go for this talk. Right? Because I'm applying reverse to x's, reverse's argument type is going to be list of beta for some as yet unknown beta. X's type is alpha, and so in order for the application to make sense, alpha must be equal to list of beta, which I'll write with a little tilde here. OK? All right. Well, now, what else do we learn? So I've just pushed, uh, I've got as far as here, I've just made it slightly smaller font. The next thing we're doing, going to type check this and. What happens for and? Well, um, it, it has type list of bool. Oh, well, now it's applied to x's. So that tells us that alpha must be equal to list of bool. Right? So now we've got two things that must be true. Alpha must be equal to list of beta. Alpha must be equal to list of bool. OK, question for the class. Figure out alpha and beta. Is it like one of those quizzes in the backs of you know, newspapers? They say, you know, Jane says this, and Bill says that, and the red door is you know, next to the house with the blue door. It's just a little, little logic puzzle, right? But this is a particularly easy one. Because, of course, if the only type that will make this second equality work is alpha equals list to be, that's a solution. Uh, the, the, the solution to the problem is 
um, is a substitution that maps these metatype variables to actual types. So here it is. Alpha must be list the bool. Look here, right? And since alpha must be uh, alpha, we now know is list the bool. List the bool equals list the beta. What must beta be? Bool, right? It's easy, right? So um, did I get this right? Yes, I did. Good. So it, it's uh, it's pretty straightforward. Then this is this 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 process here is called unification, and it's been studied for years by logicians. You know, Alan Robinson way back when. This goes right back to the beginning of um, type inference, and in dead well before type inference. Okay. So, and the, what the unification problem is, give me a set of equalities, and I will figure out the substitution that solves them. That is the task of unification. Okay. All right. Now. Uh, so now we've got to connect. I've told you about elaboration, and I told you about um, con generating constraints and solving them. How do we put those two together? Well, here's the big picture. We start with our source program. We're going to generate these constraints. Remember those two constraints we generated? Then we solve them to produce a substitution. But at the same time as we generated the constraints, we also generated an elaborated program in which every binder is decorated with its type, not yet known. And every application is, is instantiated you know, with a, a type not yet known. Remember, uh, right back here, we said start with x is alpha. We don't know what alpha is. Instantiate reverse at beta. We don't know what beta is. That's reflected here. OK? Now, in the end, having solved these things, we've now got a substitution we can apply. Apply the substitution to this elaborated term, and we get, oh, look, uh, alpha is this to beta, and bool, beta was bool, and Bob's your uncle. So we simply apply the substitution that is the solution to the constraints, apply it to the elaborated thing that has lots of uh, meta variables, unification variables inside it, and get the answer, the elaborated program. OK? That's it. Yes? Um, but that, um, that means that it will, also, it will only work if, um, while you're elaborating, the names that you're going to get will be the equivalent names of the constraints. Right? It only works if this alpha is the same as this alpha, you mean? Yes, exactly. So we don't first generate this and then generate this. There's a single function that works over the structure of the program and generates both at once. Thank you. Yes. First question, I'll buy you a drink with one of my yes. Lambda L tickets. <laughs> OK. I'll buy you a drink. <laughs> Very good. OK. Uh, now, uh, oh, this apply the substitute. If you ever look in GHC's source code and you see the word zonking, that's what's going on. It's this sort of back substitution process. OK, little, uh, little um, uh, review. Unification, unification variables, or meta-type variables, stand for types that we don't yet, yet know. We're going to generate substitutions that, when we solve them, produce a substitution that gives a type for every one of these meta-type variables. Um, and then we're going to apply it to the original elaborated term. Now, uh, the last thing to know is that these meta-type variables, these unification variables, this is a technical point, they're only going to stand for monotypes, that is, types with no for alls in them. The, the swamp gets very deep very quickly if you allow unification variables to stand for types with fools in them. I don't know how to do that yet anyway, uh, despite many attempts. So uh, we're going to stick to that. But of course, the types we finish up with uh, certainly have fools in them. We, you know, we infer um, polymorphic, fun polymorphic types. Um, OK. So far, so good. Let's just, um, I've shown you, this is, for, I've just shown you this process for things involving only types, but it scales nicely to work for type classes, right? Remember that program which had sort um, in it, and we're trying to figure out um, uh, what dictionary to pass? Well, now when we generate constraints, we're going to generate what constraints we're going to generate? Well, um, uh, let's see, we generate the, these two things. Um, uh, let's see, we'll call sort at beta. Oh, here I'm being a bit, I'm doing a few shortcuts here. I'm saying, oh, look, foo, I've told it it has type list of int, so I'll just give it that type right away during elaboration, right? As it were, I'll push the type signature down. That can be quite helpful. So it's a little bit of a shortcut. But I'm saying, I don't know what type to instantiate beta at. I don't know what type to instantiate reverse at. But then I'll generate these constraints here that, um, uh, list of delta, that was the type we instantiated reverse at. It's applied to x's, which has type list of int. So list of delta must be equal to list of int. List of beta must be equal to list of delta from the, the sort. But the interesting one is this guy. So also, when calling sort, as well as generating a constraint for that matches up its arguments, I also generate a constraint that says, somebody had better cough up a dictionary. I'll call it d of type or beta. When I figure out what beta is, I might be able to figure out how to cough up that dictionary. But for the moment, this is a, you should think of these as con constraints as things that we need. 
after all, here it is, used in the elaborated program, but not yet defined. Just as beta is used, but not yet defined. The business of the constraint solver is to define all these little holes that I've left in my program. Okay? Now, uh, how am I going to solve these? Well, I solve the, the uh, e type equality constraints as before, but this new kind of constraint, this dictionary constraint, I solve by type class resolution. In this case, beta turns out to be int, so I need a dictionary for ord int. I can apply the, uh, the instance declaration for ord int to get this named existing top level dictionary, now correctly named, and uh, then I substitute again to get this. Okay? So the point about this slide is just to say this. The same process of generating constraints and solve them works for type class constraints as well as for equality constraints. Um, but we have a new kind of constraint. These are equalities. These are type class constraints. And corresponding to a new type kind of constraint, we have a new solution method for them. Instead of unification, it's type class resolution. Same infrastructure, though. OK? All right. All right. OK. Now, next interesting thing. If you look at all the papers, all the implementations of ML and languages like ML dating back you know, 30 or even 40 years, you'll find they say, oh, unification. We could do that as we go, right? When, as soon as we encounter a unification problem, as soon as we say, oh, list of beta must be equal to list of delta, right then, we'll solve it, right? We're going to unify on the fly. I've been suggesting that we're going to generate constraints and solve them later. But the standard approach, until much more recently, was to solve these constraints exactly as they arose. You never spit them out anywhere, just solve them right away. Um, so take each constraint that survives, solves it. If it fails, report an error. Otherwise, uh, just carry on. Now, um, but for this guy, this does not work. right? Because I'm going to generate, if this, if this constraint was generated first or early, um, in fact, I think it's, I think something like this one is generated late. These two are generated early, perhaps. And I can't solve this or beta thing until I know what beta is. But all I discover is that beta is equal to delta, and I still don't know that. So, um, so I I'm sort of lost if I try to solve type class constraints immediately they arise. I can only solve them later when I've done all this unification business. So the only point I want to make on this slide is just we, the order in which we encounter constraints cannot be the same as the order in which we solve them. Yeah. What's the name of this concept of how can we differentiate different type solvers uh, to have this feature versus not? So I, I call this, this, this idea of deferring uh, constraint solving. Well, I just call it deferred constraint solving. But I'm about, I also call it the French approach to uh, building a type infant <laughs> engine, as I'll show you. Right. Who, is, who here is from France, by the way? Is anybody from France? Yeah, a couple of people. So I'm about to say very nice things about France. You'll be glad to hear. Um, let me just show, show you one other example to, uh, about that why you have to defer this solving business. Um, many of you will know that Haskell has these type level functions, right? Which a bit, so it's another kind of um, uh, instance, really. So here is a type level function, uh, FA. It's not like a data type. It's a function which takes a type and produces a type. And here is a particular equation for f. f of bool is equal to bool. But f of something else might be equal to something else entirely. Now, in this program, I generate, well, I've got, let's see, g takes an fa. g is applied to a Boolean. So I get f of alpha equals bool. Oh, I'm going to instantiate, um, f, I'm going to instantiate g at alpha. That's going to be my unknown type. So f of alpha equals bool. The second argument, second argument will be alpha and that had better be x, and x is, um, am I told what x is? No, x is beta. I don't know what x is yet, so alpha equals beta. And then not x, later, I discover x is type. That's right, x is type, which I've decided. x is type must be bool, because it's an argument to not. So later, I discover this. So I can't solve this one, even though I encountered it first in a sort of left to right traversal. I encountered it first, but then it's not till I get to here that I see beta's bool, and so that's f bool. And f of bool is equal to bool, and so I can solve this. Got it? And in fact, in pretty much any advanced um, uh, kind of advanced type system with type inference, you'll find that there's a danger that if you take a program and let's say with a tuple and you put two terms in the other order, it might type check one way, but not the other way, right? That's a reflection of a sort of best efforts constraint solver that's solving on the fly. And if you do it this way, it'll solve this one first. But if you do it this way, it'll get to this one, which is harder. And it can't solve it till it gets here. It gets stuck. See what I mean? Has that ever happened to you? Is this? OK, some nods. right? So a goal of GHC is not to have that problem. 
if you just do random swizzling, we'll still solve the constraints in some order. Yes? What kind of language features can create that kind of... What kind of language features can create that? Well, type classes, as I've just shown you, uh, type functions. Um, actually, you know, it's kind of pretty much anything interesting. <laughs> Unification, just type equality constraints, does not have that problem. Simple structural type equality constraints. You can solve unification constraints in any old order, but pretty much anything interesting, you, you get out into this. Into this. Um, and then you start have to adding type annotations and so forth. Okay? Um, I think I'm going to skip this because it's just one more example of the same kind of thing. Now, uh, so here's the picture. Um, it's called the French approach. I call it French approach because I first learned of it in this paper by um, uh, Francois Poitier and Didier Rémy from uh, India, right? And they uh, have this wonderful paper, which is very long, actually, about 60 or 70 pages, um, in which they describe how to, you can do type inference by starting with the source program, generating constraints and an elaborated program, and then separately solving the constraints. Now, um, this is good for the reasons that I've been describing, but it has another very desirable property. The source language is big. Haskell is a gigantic language. Scala is a very big language, right? They have a lot of syntactic constructs. So the t and the type checker must deal with them all. So one way is sort of desugar into a simpler language and type check that. But then, for a start, the desugared thing might not type check when the source language should have. And secondly, error messages are hard to get be make nice because you're type checking the result of desugaring uh, the original source program. So in GHC at any rate, we type check the original source program. But that is gigantic. There are like hundreds of data constructors in the syntax tree. And each one of them has to be a case in the type checker. So you want all of those cases to be simple. So constraint generation is simple, right? So the simple part is you have a, a function with a lot of cases but which each case is simple that generate constraints. The constraint language, however, is small. This is the whole constraint language that GHC uses. We'll see a little bit more of it, but my point is that it does not have very many constructs, right? So this language here is small, so the constraint solver does not have lots of cases to consider. Have I got, have I got you? Are you with me here? So it's doing something that turns out to be very subtle. The constraint solver is several thousand lines of code, but it, 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 it's all the cleverness is sort of distilled to this tiny essential language that, that has somehow articulated just exactly what is hard about uh, the type inference problem, while this guy is dealing with all the sort of the top level crap and, get, and turning it into this nice constraint problem. That's the, that's the idea. And that's the, that was the cleverness of um, Francois and Didier. So, well done, the French. Okay. <laughs> so, how's it good? Let's look in a a little bit more um, uh, detail. I want to say a little bit more about what is this constraint language and how does this solver work? So I've, as it were, I've shown you the architecture. For me, this is the key insight I'd like you to take away. If you're ever going to do a type inference engine of any kind, this is a really good architecture. And then and a way to get a lever, a sort of uh, a handle of what, the, what it's doing is to say, what exactly is this language and how does this solver work? It's a, it's like, you know, identify an abstraction. It's a bit like identifying an API or something in a library. It's so powerful. OK, so let's have a look back at this language. What is it? Well, we've seen these equality constraints, T1 equals T2. So they're not new. We've seen these class constraints. Actually, I should have said uh, the class constraints come with a name. That's the dictionary. Um, but let's leave that out for the moment. Equality constraints, class constraints. What's this? Oh, that's just conjunction. If I've got two constraints, two Ws, I can conjoin them to say and, and we've seen that already, right? I've got an equality constraint, comma, another equality constraint. That's this guy. Uh, this guy is just the empty constraint. That sometimes happens, of course. And this last one, ooh. I hope we have time to look at this, because it's super amazing. But it's not very complicated language. I hope that you have at least an intuitive understanding of the first four, right? But maybe no idea yet of the last. OK? So that is, what is this language? Uh, for these, these guys, um, we're going to, we have to construct evidence, as I've shown you. And in fact, for these guys, we're going to construct evidence as well. But I'm, I'm going to elide that in this talk. Um, for, that's one of the things I'm not going to be able to talk about. But so now I want to talk about the, um, let's see, this part, how the solver works. So remember the problem. We have now generated a huge pile of constraints, maybe thousands of them, who knows? 
And you should think of these constraints as, it's almost like another program. It really is a, it's a little data structure. When I say we, you know, we emit a constraint that looks like, uh, where's one here? We emit this constraint. Think of this as a little data structure. It's like the syntax of a, of a language. It's got a, you know, there's, a, there's an equality thing that has these two and there's this comma operator. So it's just a little syntax tree that describes the constraints. And the constraint, what is the constraint solver going to do? It's a program that takes such a data structure and somehow solves it. What does solving it mean? Well, um, it's a simple algorithm. Pick a constraint, do one rewrite, and repeat. The rewrite is meant to somehow simplify the constraint. So to take an example here, here's, uh, here's a, a big constraint. So I'm going to look, I say, I can't do anything with the whole thing. Let me zoom in on one of them. I'll just arbitrarily pick one of these, right? Pick that guy. How can I simplify that guy? Well, if list of beta is equal to list of gamma, then it's pretty obvious that beta and gamma must be equal, right? Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of follow. So, so this could only be true if beta and gamma were equal. And if they are equal, then this, you know, they're, they're, they're equivalent. So I call it decomposing. So now we got to this simpler constraint. Now what can we do? Oh, well, this can only be true. Beta equals gamma can only be true if uh, I could substitute beta by gamma, replace all the occurrences of beta with gamma, and I wouldn't have lost any solutions. One way to think of it is that each step takes a set of constraints and returns a logically equivalent set of constraints. Right? I haven't lost anything. I'm doing no guessing. I'm just working out the consequences. So consequences here is that beta and gamma must stand for the same type, which I can model by substituting beta from gamma. So on the right, I'm going to accumulate the substitution. Remember, solving simplifies the constraints and generates a substitution. That's in the blue. Now what? Um, now we've got list of delta equals list of int. What should we do? Decompose that. Right? The, only one, the only way for this to be true is if delta is equal to int. Right? Oh, now, how can I solve this? this I'll pick this one. Um, delta is a, let, yeah, well, the only way to solve delta is equal to int is for delta to be substituted by int. That's, I add that to my substitution. That's the only solution. Now, finally, I've got... Um, a dictionary of ordint. How do I solve that? Now I have to ask the type class solver, how can I get an ordint? And he looks up in his database of instances and said, well, I got one of them. It's from instance ordint, and, it's, um, and, we, and we can solve that too. Okay? And then we get to the empty constraint. Okay? So it's not, no real magic here. Actually, it's remarkably simple. Um, because we've now, remember, I've now forgotten about the program from which this arose. That's an amazing simplification. This, this, this came from some program, but when I'm doing this solving pro program process, I forget completely about the, you know, the program I'm solving for, the original source program. I'm, my mind is focused only on these constraints. Yes, over there, question. What, how do you do the rescheduling of uh, the ordering which you're solving? Oh, you mean how do you choose which constraint to solve? Yeah. Yes, I haven't given you an algorithm for deciding which constraint to solve yet. I'll get sort of a little bit to that later, but, but, but you can see that that's a, uh, at worst, you could look at them all. It wouldn't be very efficient, but you could. In, in practice, we use some kind of work queue, right? We say, just pick one. Can I do anything with it? No, stick it in a, the bag of things I haven't done. Take the next thing from the work queue, and sometimes when you put something in the bag of things you've done, you kick some out. So it's a standard sort of, you know, work remaining to be done algorithm in practice. Okay, anyone else? Yeah. Oh, yes. Very good question. Yes. So the question is, what if this doesn't work out? How do you generate decent error messages? Yeah. An amazing property of the French approach is that it's much easier to generate good error messages. Right? So that was going to be my last slide, but I'll do it now. Right? So firstly, every constraint carries with it its provenance, that is, where it came from. So this guy will say, this constraint arose from the application of reverse at this particular place in the source program. And when I turn it down into this, I keep the same provenance, right? So by the time I come to an insoluble constraint, I'll be able to say exactly where it came from in the program. That isn't always everything you might want to know, um, but it's quite good. The other thing about, um, uh, about, oh, yes, and so if there's a constraint we don't solve, can't solve, we do not report an error message right away. We just keep trying to solve constraints, and when finally we can make no further progress, so all of the constraints are not, you know, we can't make progress with, we haven't got to empty, then and only then do we report an error. 
And the advantage of that is that um, we've, by solving all the other constraints, we've cleared away stuff that might have confused that error message and left only the stuff. Yes? Can we also record an error if there's no instance in the dictionary? Oh, yes. So if there is no ORD int instance, then, of course, we can't solve this, so it'll get left behind at the end. So, in effect, at the end, what, where, you know, when you can't solve anymore, that's the residual constraint. If the residual constraint is not empty, we have a type error, and we're going to report the errors based only on the residual constraint. Essentially, we'll walk over the residual constraint, reporting each of them as, in, as a problem. And this would be exactly such a problem if there wasn't an instance. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so as your program gets better, it's true that the constraint you're trying to solve might get bigger. So a big program would lead to a big sort of tree of constraints. Um, so, of course, a big program you'd expect it to take longer to type check because it's, well, a bigger program. Um, Can you say anything about how that scaling works? No. Or at least, no, sorry, I can. Um, type inference is known to be exponentially expensive at worst case in the size of the program. And you could see this easily because you can write, even in ML, you can write a program of size n whose types are of size 2 to the n. Right? It's a sort of well-known result. So never mind how, how big type inference is. If the types in the program are exponentially big, the type checker can't possibly be less than exponential. So we know that the worst case is absolutely abysmal. The amazing thing about type inference in languages like ML, uh, like ML is that you guys don't actually write any programs with exponentially big types in them. Shockingly, um, so that type inference in practice is quite quick. That's not uh, so. G in DHC, we spend quite a bit of time looking at cases where people say, "My program seems to be taking a long time to type check." Why? So, uh, so th there's no solid, uh, you know, there's no asymptotically good result. I'm afraid, um, and even an average case, you can't really say much about because it's the kind of programs people write. Yes. Do you ever end up with a case where you have type variables that are unconstrained? Ah. What happens if we end up with the type variables that have no constraints at all? Like, if you said length of the empty list, then you'd have instantiated length at type alpha, but actually you find there's no further constraints on alpha. Length of the empty, do we mean length at type int of the empty list of ints, or length at type bool of the empty list of bools? It really doesn't matter. So actually, this is a very good question, right in this final stage of applying the substitution, if there are any type variables that are completely unconstrained, which is possible, we're going to replace them with an, a special type called any. Right? So any is just the type that says, guys, I really don't care what type. It really doesn't make any difference to this program. But I'd rather not have you know, completely free-floating meta type variables floating around after this process is complete. OK? Yeah. Oh, you mean, could this process fail to terminate at all? Is, yeah, it, I mean, is that what you mean? Basically, you, you try to kind of like say, well, I cannot resolve this, so you just basically fail at saying, I, I cannot resolve this. Well, so sometimes you know you can't solve it. If you have the constraint int equals bool, you know you can't solve that. That's not going to take you very long, right? You're just going to stop with a residual constraint that has the unsolved constraint int equals bool. I think more worrying is, could this process, this loop here, could it go on forever, right? And if you switch on undecidable instances, you know, have funny type class instances that we can't prove terminate, you, we can indeed. So, uh, so GHC has a number of knobs where people say, oh, I really want to say that. And I say, well, I can't prove that the type checker will terminate if you do that. And they, and they say, Simon, trust me. Right. <laughs> uh, so it's called uh, you know, undecidable type classes. So you have to switch it on. And that means I'm taking responsibility for making sure that my instances will terminate. So, yeah, we, we let you do both, in other words. Um, but yes, uh, you know, soon you can find that there's a Turing complete system going on in, in the type system with a very slow execution mechanism. <laughs> OK, yeah, one more. Uh, are, are language extensions generally just adding additional constraints? Very good question. Yeah, so what about language extensions? So the, the really nice thing about this approach is that it scales well. Type functions, functional dependencies, um, no, uh, quantified constraints, even the type classes themselves, 
on and on, you know, poly polymorph kind polymorphism, um, you know, and, um, you know, and, uh, uh, and coercible, the coercible class, all of that, it all just fits right in here. Yes. And in fact, it does not even expand this language very significantly. It's amazing. So this is very, very scalable to language extensions. That's one of the reasons I like it so much. OK. 10.32. Good. Now, where do we go? Uh, Mumba. I think we've said all this. Good. Now, so the last thing I want to do today is just to convey into your brains the amazingness of implication constraints. So, so far, the constraints that we've seen have been flat. You know, just a conjunction of class constraints and equality constraints. But I want to show you why it's so important to have a nesting structure to, to constraints. And that is what allows a whole raft of... So this is the one thing, uh, right? This guy is the one thing... Without this guy, uh, we're really stuck for, almost, for a lot of language extensions. This opens the door to even something as humble as type signatures for functions. For a long time, I thought, type signatures for functions, how hard can that be, right? But actually, type signatures for functions are extremely tricky for a type inference engine to accommodate, counterintuitively. Maybe I'll get, get a chance to show you that. So we're going to talk about implication constraints. But I'm going, to, I'm going to introduce them by way of existentials. So let's do a little pause to check that we'll remember about, uh, about existentials. Here's a data type um, we, whose constructor I've written in... Um, in a sort of, uh, I've just written the type, the type signature of the constructor. So it takes, um, what does it take? Well, it's got a value of type A. And here, think of this as it's got a dictionary of type A. So this constructor has two fields, a value of type A and a dictionary of type A. And it returns a value of type T, not TA. OK, not TA, just T. So that means if I say muck T3 and muck T true, if this was an int here, say, then that makes a little package here that has a show uh, dictionary for an int and an int. And here I've got a show dictionary for a bool and a bool. In fact, do I have the, oh, here they are. Look, I've, I've um, shown you them here, right? So there, it's a little package of, and this guy is a, is a dictionary that accepts values that of type int. This guy is a dictionary that accepts values of type bool. But they're different, they're different types. So I can make t's here as a list of t. All of these, each of these things has type t. It's like a heterogeneous list, if you like. OK? Now, let me see. How many of you have seen this kind of thing before? Um, oh, only a minority. OK, so everyone else, your life is going to be better once you uh, uh, get, get, uh, get comfortable with existentials. It's an amazing sort of life-enhancing experience. You know, bungee jumping has nothing on it. So, um, uh, right, so what can we do with one of these things? I mean, having got this value of type t, I might want to take it apart. When I take it apart, what can I do? Here's an example of what I can do. Um, if I take one of these t things apart, I get the payload from inside it. And then what can I do with that payload? It has type. Well, what type does it have? What type does x have? Remember, uh, x, that's this guy. So he has type A. Uh, but what is this A? Because here the A was int, and here the A was bool. See the question? What, what, what can we say about x is type? It exists. There, there is, and that's right, right. It might be int, it might be bool, it has a type. We just don't know here what it is. Um, but let's see. So, um, the right way to think about it, then, is that in the elaborated program, we, when we pattern match on mcT, we don't just get to, to name x. We get to name the type a. Right? It's bound here. Each package, you know, each mcT package, essentially packages up its type as well as the value it encloses. Does, does that make sense? And now, now I could say, well, look, if I bind a here, now x has that type a. Um, and uh, oh, and now, um, also, wh what could I do with this x? What can I do with the value of type A? Well, in general, not much, right? But that's why it's useful to have this show dictionary here. That's one thing I can do it. I can show it. And that produces a string. And everything's cool, right? So this, this dictionary here is of type show A, the same A. So its show method is compatible with x. And 
everything is wonderful. So you could, this is a function you can write, therefore. Right? So we've got a heterogeneous list of things, but by applying f to each of them, we can turn them all into strings. OK? All right. So now, so this, is, this has been in Haskell for, forever. I'm sure that Scala has this in some shape or form, right? Somebody say yes. There's a thumbs up over here. OK, so um, <clears throat> right. Now, uh, how am I going to type check this? Let's suppose I just applied the same um, regime. I just generate constraints, right? So ah, oh, let's say f. Let's say just we start off with f as type alpha. Um, then we come across the lambda. So alpha would better be equal to beta to gamma, where t. Uh, here has type beta. Um, that's what we know from the lambda. Then from the case, we can say case t of, oh, look, t. So t must be of type t up here. So beta here, uh, that is this guy, uh, must be a t. Then, we, uh, then, we, then from the call to show, we're going to need a, um, uh, something of type, well, what's delta? Instan oh, I'm going to instantiate show with delta. Don't know what delta is yet. So I'm going to need a show delta. Then I'm from the call of show x, here, x is of type A, so that means that delta must be A, um, and gamma, the result of foo, had better be string, because that's the result of show. So that's kind of quick how I might generate constraints. Right. But there's something very wrong about this, isn't there? What, what, you know, what in your soul is telling you there's something deeply wrong about what I'm showing you here? Um, the alphas and betas are fine, we know about them. But there's something else in these constraints that is deeply suspicious. Where's the arrow? Was the, what's the arrow? This guy? Yeah. Oh, here's the ordinary function arrow. All we're saying here is that alpha, that is the unknown type of f, had better be equal to a function from some type to some other type because there's a lambda. So that's not mysterious. Um, no. Maybe I'll have to tell you it is Saturday morning. So remember, these constraints should be well scoped. And what, what is this guy? What is this A? If I had another pattern match involved, you know, also on Muk T, would it use the same A or different A? What is this A? You know, it's sort of floating about in space. Right, remember, it's a bit like a program in which you say f of x is y. And you, as a programmer, you think, come on, guys, y. What is this y? Y should have a binding site, right? You can't say f of x equals y, because f of x equals x, or x plus 1, but not f of x equals y, unless y is bound somewhere. And it's just like that. What is this a? It's not bound anywhere in these constraints, right? If I, uh, yeah, so, bad. OK, so, um, uh, secondly, there's no way to solve this guy. Show delta. Well, delta is going to, how can I solve show a? Huh, show a. If I look up in all my type class instances, there's nothing for show a. Anyway, a is very locally bound here. That was ridiculous. So. What are we going to do? So here's the very simple idea. We're going to generate instead this constraint. I'm just going to put the red bit in. This thing here, the whole of this, this is an implication constraint. And it goes, for all something, here's the syntax, for all something, some constraints, double arrow, some constraints. Now what does that mean? Here, for all A, that's the binding site for A. And it corresponds to this pattern match, remember, because I'm binding A right, right here in this pattern match. And it, I'm also binding, remember, in my elaborated program here, I'm binding A and the dictionary for show. They get bound locally, right, right in this pattern match. So I need to bind them locally in the constraint. Right? So here it is. I'm binding the dictionary for show. And now here are the things I need to solve. This is the body of. These are the constraints that arise from the right-hand side of the case alternative. So this, this implication is generated from the case alternative. Each case alternative generates a separate implication. Um, and the implication binds these existential variables and the existential dictionaries. And then the body of the implication, that is, uh, that is uh, this part, the W2 part, that is the constraints that are in the, in the right-hand side of implication that we must solve. And now I've answered both the questions, you see. What is A? It's bound here. How do I solve show delta? Well, I'm going to, that's this dictionary. Delta is going to turn out to be equal to A. So this is D colon show A. How can I solve that? How can I solve? I need a dictionary of, of type show A. Where can I get it from? Here, right? I need this guy. I can get it right from here. And in fact, that corresponds precisely to the fact that 
um, that GD by really will be bound here, and I need to use him here. So simple. Right. But this, I, this, this took me, I tell, so, so you're feeling slightly um, uh, alarmed. This, this took me about a year to understand. Uh, but uh, then I was trying to read Francois and Didier's papers, which take no prisoners. I tell you, yes. Muck T is a data constructor like cons for lists. Okay. Yes. So when I wrote its original data type declaration, I wrote it like this. But this is a data type, de algebraic data type. Muck T is a data constructor. And it's Haskell's way of introducing types that have these existential symbols. So just go back to the question of Scala got something similar. Yeah. Like, does even Scala have to give it a, a generic type on the. Oh, you'd have to say TA here. Ooh. Oh, no, no, no. no, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, no, I'm sure Scala can do this. I'd be very astonished if Martin had not. No, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Fine. OK. Um, so uh, that's why right. Haskell, the gateway drug to Scala. You know. <laughs> yeah, anybody else? So this is, this is the, uh, the, the, just the last key, key thing that I just wanted to get across today, is the, the role of implication constraints, because that allows you to do all sorts of things. It allows you to do these existentials, type signatures, and much more besides. OK? Um, All right, uh, so I've, I've said that. Right, so now um, this is just the solving process. Now when I'm solving this implication, now I go under the implication and solve. Rather than just picking one from a flat collection of constraints, I now have to, as it were, descend into the tree. So I descend into the tree. Here's my whole implication. I say, well, I could solve that. I could solve that. But then I go underneath here and solve this delta equals a by um, substituting. Now I've got to solve D show A. Well, I can solve it from here. And then I've also got to solve gamma equals string, and I can solve that, and I get my elaborated program. So the solving process then, once I've got to implication constraints, solving is quite straightforward. OK, um, let's see. Uh, just a remark that now we've got two kinds of variables. These alphas and betas, they're the unification variables, remember? They are the guys that are standing for a type that we do not yet know, but we're going to get rid of them in the end. Now, these A's, guys, these guys bound here, those are so-called scolum constants. That's a word you can impress your friends with when you go to pubs, right? <laughs> I just saw this scolum constant in my program. And um, this is a, so it's, it stands for a type. You don't know what type, but in most ways, it behaves like list or tree or int or something. It's, just like, it's a bit like a type constructor. You can't do anything, anything with it. It's just a type that's different to all other types, and it's called A. That's all you know about it, OK? Uh, right. OK. I think I've said all that. Now, um, so now we are, OK, right, so it's now 10.45, so we should, we should wrap, yes, in five minutes. Um, let's see. So I'm going to skip, uh, there's lo lots, of, lots, uh, tons more to tell you about um, level numbers that I'm going to, um, oh, I'm, I'm going to tell you about one thing about level numbers. Look at this. Um, do we want this program to type check? Case T of Look tx, how about x? So remember, x's type is different for each muk t. It was, it was the guy who built the muk t could build it with an int, or could build it with a char, or could build it with a bool. So we don't really know what x's type is, only that it's of type a. So what type could we possibly give to f2? We can't possibly say it returns a value of type a. We could possibly say it returns a value of type exists a, but. Uh, but Haskell doesn't have that type. We certainly can't say it has the type for all a t arrow a. That would be ridiculous, right? That would say, for every a, you give me a t, I'll give you an a back. That's, that's not going to work, right? So we have to reject this program. How do we reject this program? Well, the constraints we generate turned out gamma, the return type of the function, must be equal to a, this locally bound thing, right? So what we want to make sure is that this a here, bound here, doesn't leak out to this gamma outside here. It's that, it's called existential escape, right? The prisoner who's meant to be stuck inside here has sort of tunneled out through this unification variable, right? We have to lock the doors. And the way we can lock the doors is by um, giving all the unification variables level numbers. So this is level number one. An implication constraint bumps the level number. It has level number two. Under an implication constraint, you cannot unify any, any unification variables from outer levels, right? They are, because in, in case you, accidentally unify them with one of these um, 
It's got to have constants. Okay? That's a key, key idea. To, so you, this is something you must prevent happening at all costs, otherwise you simply have bad, badly typed programs. Okay. Uh, let's see. Then there's lots, lots more to say. Uh, I want to talk about, um, uh, just to uh, finish up, I also want to give you some pictures about constraint solving. So here's a, um, here's a program with two implication constraints that somehow, I don't know what program this came from, but it's a program that, in which I generated two implication constraints and an ordinary old constraint. Um, and I just want to point out that um, uh, solving can occur all over the place. Here's some, remember, uh, this guy uh, is not unifiable because he comes from an outer level, level one. He's under a level two constraint. This guy is. So what are we going to do? Um, here, we can start here, eek of a pair. Yes, I can use the type class solver to solve that. So I can go to this part. Then I can't make any other progress here. Um, but, oh, I could make some progress on here. Beta, beta 1 equals bool. That's our next guy to solve. Uh, get rid of him altogether. That was good. What can I do next? Um, oh, uh, maybe, oh, so wait, beta equals bool. I added, oh, sorry, so beta equals bool. There's the substitution. Replace beta by bool here. Do the substitution. Now I can solve this guy. Oh, he's gone. Very good. What next? Ah, uh, can't solve equals alpha. Oh, but over here, I got alpha equals int. I can't solve it there, but maybe I could float it outside like this, right? Uh, look at that. He moved from here uh, outside of that for all because he didn't mention b. Now I can solve him because he's not under an implication. So alpha is equal to int. Oh, discard, sorry, discard that empty guy. Then make alpha equal to int, and then substitute for alpha, and then solve that, and then get rid of that, and now we're back, back up to empty. So the, the, what I want, the impression I want to give you is you have to do a little bit over here, a little bit over here, you know, and you may have to, may have to iterate this a bit. This is, what the, this is the power of treating constraint solving as a separate problem, because you've generated the constraints once and for all. That's why I mentioned this before. I just wanted to give you a picture of it in action. OK? All right. Uh, so. Um, the advantages of being French, yes. Uh, right. I've said this multiple times, but it's the one thing I want you to take away from this. Constraint generation has a lot of cases, but each case is easy. Constraint solving is really very tricky, but it only has a few cases to deal with. Um, and then the, finally, there's this connection, which isn't in the French paper, by the way, the connection between the elaborated program and the constraint solving mediated by this substitution. That's really important. Um, so, uh, and um, we talked a lot about order. Um, and um, uh, and we, yeah, we talked about order. This is um, uh, and we talked a little bit about error messages, right? That this is really good for solving error messages. Here's a particularly concrete case. Um, if you've got, uh, uh, you'd rather report I can't match list of int with bool than list of alpha with bool, where alpha is something that actually something else works out. Um, and moreover, it's very modular. Instead of having error message generation all over the type checker, there's a single module in GHC that, that's not even connected with the solver. We've got the generator, the solver, and the error message producer. The error message producer takes the output of the solver, says, I'll do my best. Here are the things I can't solve, and it tosses those to the error message generator, and its only business in life is to generate good error messages. It's still 2,000 lines of code, because it's got to walk over constraints and try to generate human-readable error messages, but it's completely separated from both constraint generation and from constraint solving. Um, OK, in fact, here it is. I said 2,000. I was wrong. It's only 800 lines. Um, but there's uh, 3,000 lines of constraint generation, 3,000 lines of constraint solving. Um, right. Uh, right. Uh, and there's a ton of things that I've not had time to talk about, but my uh, remark is only that if, you, if you've got a sense of this, then you know, all of this is just, well, we just do more of the same kind of thing. This is the foundation of everything. Um, uh, and that's really the, the good news of, of this talk. <laughs> Haskell has this particularly crazy type system, and yet, so far, we haven't found anything that doesn't fit into this framework. And that's, that's a, as the person responsible for implementing the type system, that's incredibly helpful because uh, it keeps me sane. Um, so, any other observations or questions? Um, surely there are. Yes. Oh, so I said it scales well with language extensions. What about dependent Haskell? So indeed, Haskell is getting more and more dependent, as you know. Uh, and each time we do that, we have to look at the constraint solver again. Um, and this involves you know, me and Richard Eisenberg sit in a room and bash, bash our heads together. But, it, so, but the answer is, nothing. That we have found nothing that invalidates this story. In fact, we couldn't have done it without this story. Um, so it, it's completely on the path, yes. 
including all the elaboration. Yeah. Have you written papers on the historic Oh, have I written papers about this? So, so yes, in the sense that there's a paper called Practical Type Inference for Higher Rank Types that's uh, um, a good, good baseline. Then there's another one called Modular Type Inference, the outside-in algorithm. Um, the, and that describes this generate and, uh, generate and check thing. But what I have not got is a paper that re that, uh, the paper of this talk that really explains the nitty-gritty of how the solver works. Um, for example, the stuff about floating out that I described, that's not anywhere described. So that's mea culpa. I really try hard to write a paper about everything we do that seems interesting in Haskell. I keep failing to do this because it will be a long paper. Um, it will be a 100-page you know, epic, I think. Just need to find enough time to do that. Anyone else? Uh, yes. So, <coughs> the paper you mentioned was published in 2005. Uh, so was this as... Which, which of the two? The outside-in paper is much later, I think. The practical type inference for high rank types, yes. Yes, that was published in 2005. So yes, it was, yes. When there was this added or oh, implemented in Haskell quite recently after that? Oh, so when was the generate, generate constraints and solve? Yeah. When, did, when did I do this thoroughgoing... I can't actually remember. I think it must have been about 15 years ago. Yes, sort of. So it was sort of around that time. Certainly by 2010, I think this approach was in. Okay, so yeah. you replaced a different approach. Oh, we replaced the sort of solve constraints on the fly approach. Right. Yes, right. yes, that's right. So we've moved in a solid way to. In fact, the, again, the truth is that there are some constraints. If we're about to generate the constraints alpha equals int, then we think, guys, why am I going to generate constraints alpha equals int? I can solve it instantly now with no questions asked. So in fact, GHC does solve on the fly anything that is really easy. But it, the, the invariant is it should be possible to solve nothing just generate constraints, so it's just an efficiency gain to solve some on the fly. So, in fact, the on the fly bit is still there, left over. Yes? Uh, I'm curious, with those constraints, uh, how will you encode the GADTs uh, with those constraints? Oh, how do we encode GADTs? Well, actually, it's very, I showed you that, that um, existential thing kind of is an example of a GADT. And GADTs have, um, uh, they just have uh, extra equality constraints among the, uh, let's see, we're, we're in my existential example, uh, uh, back here. Um, here. So the only difference with the GADT is that you can have um, equality constraints here as well, right? Not just type class constraints. So these, remember, are the, the, the givens, the things that are bound by. The existential. So the, so the answer is I've shown you type class constraints here. GADTs just add equality constraints, and everything works out completely smoothly. So it exactly incorporates GADTs, yes. In fact, that was a major motivation for doing this, is again, it makes it possible to type GADTs in a civilized way. Good question. Yes? <laughs> yeah. A second question is, um, as an early career developer, where might I start seeing some of the things you're talking about in the early stages of my career? Where can I look out for them? Would I encounter these issues at all? So the two questions. One is, how, how, how can I understand anything you say? <laughs> it's an excellent question. And the second is, where, you know, what forums should I look out for stuff in? So, in some ways, for the former, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. Other people in this room might be better. Because, um, uh, but except to say that the early stages of programming with types, everything, well, of course, I'm, again, the wrong person to ask. It, just simple, simple types with no polymorphism. I take a function that takes an integer. I better give it an integer. That seems quite simple and intuitive. Adding parametric polymorphism with no type classes or anything, that doesn't seem so hard. So as it were, a sort of step at a time approach in which you just add the little pieces one at a time um, seems quite helpful. Then at, at, at some stage, it, uh, everything starts to fit together. But there, there are also lots of tutorials. So, but really, got, uh, who, who else in the room would like to help on how would you understand anything Simon says? Or, yeah, go over there, yeah. Oh, right now? No, yeah, just, just yeah. Uh, uh, where, 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 where should our colleague look? Um, the experience yep. that I have is that you, you constantly feel you're drowning, and at some point, the moment you're exposed to dialectical effort, it makes sense. 
I would agree with everything you say, you say, except for the point that you get to the point that everything makes sense. <laughs> I think it is in the nature of human beings, smart human beings like every person in this room, that we push ourselves to the point at which we think, Simon, if you, oh, you were just a bit cleverer, you would be able to understand this. I think that all the time. So your, your sense of being a bit drowning, I think, is everybody's sense. We're always at, we're always at the limit of what we can do. You just have to sort of draw back a bit and say, actually, there's quite a lot that I do know, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly, yes. So after you have written a function to reverse a list of integers, and then a function to reverse a list of characters, and then a function to reverse a list of booleans, then you think to yourself, there has to be a better way to do this, right? Can't I just write a function that reverses a list of anything? And then you think, what type could I give to that? And suddenly, parametric polymorphism is like the only thing. It's obviously what God intended, you know, it just has to be. Um, <laughs> So, and that's, that's the real way to understand types, I think, is when you, you, you desperately want it and suddenly it's possible, then you think, oh, no, I understand this type system. <laughs> uh, I'm very sorry to interrupt, yeah. Simon. <laughs> Part of me wants to just cancel all of the other talks and let him speak all day. <laughs> no, 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 but we should probably move on. Um, we don't have any break time, so we'll just go straight into our next talk, which will be Tam. Okay, thank you.